All right, guys, sing it with me. Happy birthday to Z. That's right, guys. We're singing happy birthday to the Kawasaki ZH2. It's been here over a year. If you get a chance, you see Dan Milholland, shake his hand. <laughs> I'll bet most of you would not loan us your ZH2 for a year for product development. Anyway, enough of the comedy. <laughs> I'm Brock from Brock's Performance. We are going to give Dan his motorcycle back. We believe we've had it plenty long enough. So what we're going to do in this episode is a couple things. I want to go over what we got accomplished with this bike. It's a really nice bike. I like it a lot. Go over the, just some of the parts that we're going to do or uh, parts that we've made. Then I'm going to, uh, I just took it for a ride to get it warmed up. I'm going to drain the oil, change the filter since Dan's coming to pick up the bike in preparation. But Dan, Dan's a drag racer. His boys are drag racers. They've both raced professionally for uh, one of them for Kawasaki uh, for a while. So really good drag racers. So we're going to convert his clutch over. No, I'm not going to do another long, boring ass 45 minute on installing or converting a clutch. But what I am going to do, I've noticed that we're at a sort of a different level than some other places. So when we say we're going to convert a clutch what does that mean why would you do it what benefit is it going to be for dan and what possible benefit could it be for you so i'm just going to talk about that a little bit as we're preparing this bike to go back home to his owner so anyway without further ado let me uh let me get ready i'll give you a little tour of what we've done right after this all right, so what have we managed to accomplish with Kawasaki's naked supercharged street killer? I'm just going to go from the front back and just sort of talk to you a little bit. And I want to make sure we have a lot of companies that we work with that help us with things. And I want to make sure I give them all credit. So uh, starting here at the front, I guess the very front, we put worldwide bearings, ceramic bearings in the bike. Uh, Dave from 40 is a great guy. We give him the dimensions, he makes the bearings, your bike goes faster. Uh, then we come back a little bit, you've got our radial mount uh, strap brackets here and a, radi and a strap. So what's the strap for? Well, <laughs> it lowers your front end, compresses it, helps you, prevent you from doing wheelies. Now this bike is going back to the hills of Tennessee. Are we going to take the strap off? No. Strap can stay there anytime. In fact, we tie it up here to where if you're at a if you're at a stoplight and one of your buddies gets a little mouthy, you just grab this strap, grab the front brake, push down, you're lowered, the bike's going to not wheelie as much. Next time you get stopped, you loosen it up, your suspension works just like normal. Uh, okay, so now we're over here. I'll let you guys stay there. <laughs> Sprint filter. They were instrumental in getting an air cleaner for this bike. Uh, we sent them one, they sent us a prototype, a uh, printed prototype. They have the best filter money can buy. We stand by them 100%. They're fantastic. Not only do you go faster, but your, your engine's cleaner. Everything about them is better. So we want to thank our friends at Sprint Filter. Um, coming back, back to the whole drag race thing, we did lower the front end. And on a bike like this, you're really limited. Um, without making major changes, we could only lower the forks just to where they touch the bottom of the handlebars. It was about an inch and an eighth, I think, but every little bit helps and combined with the strap, that'll really get the thing lowered in the front. Uh, move back here a little bit more. Ah, uh, so what happens when you have a supercharged bike that has the wheelbase of a 600? Man, this thing is a wheelie machine. The problem with wheelie machines are is they get twitchy and they can get a little uncomfortable. And one of the things that we noticed, we work with our friends at Batubo, we came up with the mounting. They sent us a damper that would help fit because it's really tight in here uh, clearance wise. You can't just run any damper. But one of the things that we noticed on this particular bike, the way the steering head is set up, the way the geometry is, and all of the leverage you have with these bars, a standard steering damper was not sufficient. Could you feel some damping? Yes. 
but some dampening is not what you need when you've got a bike capable of running whatever 186 or miles an hour or 300 kilometers per hour and most of it getting there is on the back wheel so uh, we work with them they came up with special valving for us said we managed to make this whole uh, the whole mount here and I'm real happy with that it's super clean looks factory uh, we cut the uh, we did have to cut the ignition cover here but we're going to offer those ready to go so just a real clean look and uh, the nice thing typically you want some extra room right it depends on what kind of racing you're do, doing if you're doing land speed I remember I raced at Maxton once and <laughs> I cranked my damper down because that place was just bumpy and terrible and as I was slowing down I'm thinking you know I, I need to crank this thing down a little bit more well, I want to caution you guys, when you have a damper that really does a good job, if you're going down the road and you tighten it up, <laughs> it's very difficult to steer. So make your adjustments when you're parked. Um, the good news is, is that this is not too crazy severe. It's not like if you go to one click too far, it's going to lock up and you're going to just fall over, but just be conscious of it. So moving back a little bit further, um, we have our uh, supercharger sprocket cover. And by popular demand, they are also now available in Stupid Fast in addition to the Brox logo. Uh, we come back here, we've got our pentacarbon exhaust. Dan selected the black Cerakote and the, and the gloss end cap from BST. Why? Because Dan has the, what will be the first <laughs> uh, set of Rapid Tech BSTs for the ZH2 once again. We were able to take this bike, take it apart, send the dimensions to BST. Next thing you know, we've got really, really nice wheels coming. I wish they were here. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't made it yet. Some type of delays we've been dealing with, but it's not the company's fault. It's just the way stuff happens. So once they come, we'll send them to Dan. He'll take care of them. Uh, one thing about carbon fiber wheels, a lot of guys are really worried. You know, Brock, can you put my tires on? I don't trust my tire guy. Well, keep this in mind. Ducati has OEM motorcycles with carbon fiber wheels, which means every Ducati dealership has to have a technician trained in putting tires on carbon fiber wheels. So if you don't trust your local guy or whatever, that might be an option for you. Uh, let's see, moving back a little bit further, our friends at Spiegler came up. Now, this is not the line. This is just a, a actually, this is a dummy line. Uh, we've got a six inch overline that goes with the swing arm extensions. Dan said he would prefer to try to see how fast this bike can go stock wheelbase. So we're gonna send the extensions with him in addition to the really nice looking over, oversized uh, black on black Spiegler cable. And yeah, what am I trying to say? Brake line instead of that one. Oh, to lower the rear, we have our Brock's Performance window links work out really nicely. So the thing we've done, this bike, we've lowered it as much as we think we can and to still be able to get, a, get away with riding on the street. Pull the strap, it's going to go quicker, quicker at the drag strip. What's it going to go? What would anybody <laughs> like to go? I can tell you this, in bone stock form, 95% of riders could not get this bike in the nines. Bone stock. Roll it off your showroom floor, take it to your drag strip, and try to run nines with it. You, 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 you're not going to do it. If you're, you know, a professional, you might squeak into the nines, but I'm telling you, this thing is a challenge, and a lot of it is because of the clutch. Um, ceramic bearings in the rear wheel, and boy, I think I think that's about it on the uh, on the surface. I wonder what anybody else would wonder about. Hmm. The ECU. Oh, that's right. How can I forget to mention the UCU? Let me show you guys something. Because I'm going to be straight up honest with you. This ECU is kicking our rear end. And when I say our, I mean our collective. The motorcycle industry's rear end who uh, can typically crack into one of these things and give us full power. So we get questions all the time. Brock, what do you think about this bike? What about this bike? The 2021 ZX10. I want to buy one and make it fast. Okay. The new Honda. Okay. The ZH2. What the hell is that thing? What is that? Does anybody know what that is? Let me tell you what this is. 
This is Euro 5 compliance, which means if the bike you are looking at, BUSA, has one of these, it's going to have the same trouble that we're having with this bike until we can get that cured. So anyway, um, what do we know? All right, let me tell you what we know. We know that every tool we have doesn't work. And imagine this, let's say you have a safe and you want to crack it. Well, what's inside the safe? Don't know, can't crack it. And that's where we are right now. Still working on it hard. Am I saying that it's never gonna get done? No, but I am saying it's gonna be pretty tough and may take a while. So what did we do? Um, we've got a pipe on here, we've got a filter. Well, we worked with our friends at DinoJet. They were nice enough to create a uh, ZH2 Power Commander 5 for us. And then when we went to take all the cables off the stock exhaust, it's throwing codes like mad, right? So we went in and removed the exhaust servo. We put a servo buddy in. We're sort of kicking it old school with this. So basically all we did was fake the bike into thinking that that servo valve is still connected. It doesn't throw codes and we can get to what we're doing. We created all the mapping for it and we got, I mean, I'm real happy with the power. We made 200 horsepower. That's pretty darn good. And uh, especially on a bike like this. So if any of you are thinking, oh man, I'm not gonna buy it. If it doesn't have a cracked ECU, it's not gonna be any fun. <laughs> no, this bike with 200 horsepower, even restricted, will put a smile on any enthusiast face. This thing is a ball. It, it kicks ass. I wish I had one myself. In fact, I may put it on my Christmas list. So anyway, that's that. Sorry, I wish we had better luck for you, but we don't think we should hold on to Dan's bike just in case it might get cracked. Once it gets cracked, we'll send him the cure. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to uh, change his oil and filter. And we'll talk about clutches a little bit, and we'll do that right after this. Get it, get it, get it. Alright, set that down for our previous videos. <laughs> the key goes somewhere else. Alright, we're going to let that drain for a little bit and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to just give a basic clutch overview as soon as I get this cover off and then we'll talk. Easy, almost like I've done that before. Alright while I'm making my ZH2 clutch cover template, you may notice that this rear end just got a whole lot sexier. All that stuff gone. Uh, Dan sent us a really nice uh, Graves tail tidy. Uh, he's got some different turn signals he's gonna end up putting on, but I, I don't have them right now. But man, did it clean up the back of this thing. I always liked the way the front of the bike looked, but now gotta get it at the right angle. We are looking good. Pin of carbon, clean. Look at that. Match those lines. It may not be the fastest supercharged bike out of there, but it's one of the best looking for sure, in my opinion. You know what? Give me another pan or I'm going to get have some trouble here. Uh, you know what else? I really don't want to do that with this plastic here because. We're gonna drip some oil, and that's the last thing we need is dripping a bunch of oil on Dan's nice plastic. So we'll pull that off real quick. All right. Now, the infamous bread pan can do its job. Any other little brackets? Oh, yeah. Oh, I missed one directly underneath there. See that? Maybe I haven't done this before. All right. So it doesn't matter which way you pull these out. It does not. As a general rule, you would tighten them from the inside and go outward. So to pull them out, you would start on the outside and go inward, which I didn't do. And it's just not going to matter. It's all here. Tie wrap guy, but I 
I gotta tell you, sometimes they're a little bit of a pain. All right. I just pulled this little thing out here because if I cut the tie wrap, it's gonna be it's gonna be done. I have to replace a new one. It just slides right in there. No big deal. All right. Let's try to get this cover off. Ooh. What is all this funness? Pretty nice. Brand new motorcycle. All right. Clutches. So simple, yet misunderstood. So in a nutshell, what is a clutch? All it is is a device that transfers the power that your engine is generating from your engine through your drivetrain to your rear wheel in its simplest forms. Basically what you've got, and I've got plenty of videos on this, I don't need to go through it in, in huge detail, but basically you have a drive plate and a driven plate and a bunch of them, right? And it's current configuration right now with the clutch out, it has clamped the clutch. When I pull in on the clutch, you'll notice the pressure plate move away. Once the pressure plate moves away, the clutch is no longer clamped, so you can you can coast. Um, so clamped, unclamped. This is the latest, greatest version. The motorcycle OEMs love it. They call it an assist clutch. So what is an assist clutch? Well, if you see here, you're going to notice there, the thing only has three clutch springs. And I'm going to explain to you here in a second why three clutch springs not that long ago would never ever work out in a motorcycle. But on this particular one, you only have three clutch springs. Well, what's that mean? It means you get a really nice, soft lever pull. And I have spoken to Japanese engineers. They pride themselves in a very soft lever pull. So how can you get a soft lever pull but also get a lot of clamp force? That's what we're going to talk about here right now. All right, let's first start off with some brief clutch terminology. So you'll hear people talk about a clutch basket. Well, what is your clutch basket? It's this thing, this round thing that holds your clutch. It's also known as an outer basket or an outer hub. Now, what, what does this do? If you look right here, you see these teeth? This is actually on the, on the uh, crankshaft. That's a connecting rod behind it. So the crankshaft's spinning like this, spinning in, in a, a forward direction, and its gear is meshed with this outer basket or outer hub, which spins in this, in this backwards direction. So what does that mean? That means that when your engine is running, this is spinning no matter what. It's going to spin, it's connected. If it doesn't spin, you got big problems. So how does the power get applied? Well, we have what's called, we've got a pressure plate here, and we've got some springs, and we've got what's called an inner hub. Now, it's a little convoluted on this bike, so if I look at this, just a good old-fashioned clutch setup. You've got your inner clutch hub or inner basket. They're also called inner baskets. Here's our pressure plate, and then we have various springs that compress the clutch. And when I say compress the clutch, it just moves, moves in and out like I showed you with your lever, and when it does, so, your drive plates are, are latched into your outer basket. So they're always going to be spinning. Your driven plates are here latched onto your inner hub. So when you compress the clutch, now it spins the inner hub, which is connected to your input shaft of your transmission. Input shaft goes through gears, goes through gears, goes to your output shaft output shaft goes to the rear wheel. So that's it in, in its simplest form. And this would be considered just a standard clutch with no slipper, with no assist, with nothing, just a good old fashioned clutch. Well, back in the old days, if we wanted a good old fashioned clutch, let's, let's say we built our engine and the engine was faster and we're at the racetrack and our mile an hour is off, or we can hear the clutch slip. Well, what were our options? Generally, you would take your stock springs and replace them with heavy-duty springs, right? And the only difference is, is that this spring is going to squeeze this, the pressure plate, tighter so your clutch doesn't spin as much. Real straightforward, right? 
Um, enter, and really it was the late 90s, and I don't need the internet world going, no, Brock, the Hayabusa wasn't the first with a slipper clutch. I don't know if it was. I'm just saying that the Hayabusa, when it came out in 99, was the first slipper clutch we had to deal with. So let me tell you what a slipper clutch does. I'm gonna pull this out. Now, I'm not gonna put these studs in here because you'll, you'll get the point. So in a regular clutch, this is all rigid. When the Hayabusa came out, it had what they called a back torque limiting slipper clutch or slipper clutch or back torque limiter or whatever you wanna call it. And basically the whole idea behind it was that now when you downshift the bike, this would rotate and it would take the pressure plate and loosen it just a little bit. Well, what does that do? That means that when you downshift, your back wheel doesn't bark on a regular clutch without a slipper. When you downshift and let the clutch out too aggressively, it's gonna bark. If you're road racing, you get tire hop, you'll come into a corner, it'll go ba -da -ba 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 -ba. It's not desirable. That's why they created this. Now, a lot of people think this was also a lockup. It wasn't. It did rotate a little bit, which put, which made the distance on the spring smaller, gave it a little bit more pressure, but it didn't have nearly enough pressure for most of our needs. So, what did that mean? That means you took the 1999 Hayabusa, they could go 200 miles an hour out to your local drag strip, tried to race it, all your buddies are watching, everybody's watching, man, look at that bike. Joe's got the coolest bike in town. He gets out there and goes, mm -hmm. I know you like that. I'm not gonna do it again. What would happen is, is basically when you went to let the clutch out, when this went to press in, this thing started doing one of these numbers, and I promise you, you could not control that bike smoothly if it was doing that. Now, and this is the asterisk we have to put next to everything. If you put an 18 inch over swing arm on your bike, you're not doing this. You're going, uh. Well, if you do that and you've got unlimited traction, Chris Moore, <laughs> and you've got a bike as long as an aircraft carrier, Chris Moore, you can get away with a modern day clutch without having to worry about anything. But if you try and shorten up your bike and you actually have to ride it, it doesn't work. There's more. I know because I sent him all the stuff to fix it. So anyway, what happened? Well, at first, the only thing we knew was, I don't know what this thing is, but I need to disable it. So I grabbed some beer and my welding torch and I built a little fixture and you can see, I just went together welding these up. What did that do? That went from this to this. And then all of a sudden, that bike that wouldn't go anywhere and embarrass you in front of your friends. Thank you, Suzuki, for putting this stuff in there. Fed my family for years. All of a sudden, your bike would start working and you could start using some of that fantastic power and performance that Suzuki gave us with the Hayabusa. Now that we've gone through different versions of this over the years, now we've got our Ultra Mod super light we sell just thousands of these things so we managed to fix the problem on the hayabusa when it came to the slipper clutch all right now i'm gonna switch gears on you a little bit from the latest greatest stock stuff to what happens if you put nitrous on your bike what if you build your engine what if you just can't get enough with turbo bikes. Turbo bikes are bad about that. They make so much torque at such a low RPM, it's hard for the clutch to grab. So what happens there? Well, our friends at MTC, and there's several other places, but MTC was the leader at the time, came up with various contraptions. Now, this is called a single stage lockup clutch. And basically what this is doing is, you've got your regular clutch springs moving this in and out, but, once the clutch gets all the way, once, once the bike starts to move and your inner basket moves, these levers would actually, now think about it, this thing starts to spin. These nuts and bolts are nothing but they're ballast, they're weights. So you put some nuts and bolts on there, 
you let the clutch go, this thing starts to spin, centrifugal force comes over, and all of a sudden, urgh, you got all this pressure. Mm, my clutch is no longer slipping. But <laughs> as soon as the bike rolls, this thing starts locking up, and you got wheelies or tire spin or whatever problem. But this was a big, big help for land speed racers. I got into the sevens on my Bandit with this exact setup. It did work, but it came with its challenges. One of the challenges was it didn't fit. Obviously, it wasn't made to go in the bike. So you got to put on these sweet little spacers here, uh, which, which, you know, if you got a Sidewinder exhaust, that just meant your pipe didn't fit anymore. So make new pipes and anyway, all I'm trying to show you is there, this is what's, this is a mechanical advantage, right? So this takes over where the springs no longer are doing the only job of compressing the clutch. What in God's name does this thing have to do with that bike? Let me show you something. Believe it or not, in this tidy little package, we have three lightweight springs, smooth, nice delivery. Behind it, we have a slipper clutch, similar to the Hayabusa, but more sophisticated. And now in our top half, we have what, they, what, what we consider the assist part of it, and you've got ramps. And what those ramps do is once you get into the gas, they tighten up, sort of like those weights going out. So now you've got a mechanical advantage over top of your clutch springs, and you get a really, really nice clutch. A bike like this, I mean, the faster you go and the more power you make, the more it'll lock up. So. If you're a street rider, you don't drag race, you like going into corners, you like doing high speed roll on, so long as you're not going from a dead stop, these are a really nice setup. You can make some slight adjustments to them and make them work pretty well. As soon as that bike is at a dead stop and you want to get the most out of it, this no longer works. And I'll get into more detail there in a minute. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take this apart so I can show you visually what we just talked about just in a slightly different form. So, you have to take these out a little bit of time. You don't want to tear anything up. So, Ben, what do the clutch springs actually do in this, in this scenario? <laughs> In its simplest form, it's a spring that lets your lever go back forward after you pull it in. For real, because once, once the assist section starts working, that's what's doing the clamping. But it's also responsible for your feel. Some riders, myself included, I like, I like a stiffer clutch. So uh, to get sort of a, a, like a little, the initial hit just a little bit harder, that's why we make uh, stiffer springs for this assist situ uh, clutch situation here. So let me get this out of the way. We'll show you what's happening. In fact, if I was smart, I'll just take them over there and we'll set them side by side and compare. I like thinking I'm smart. Yeah. Why don't I do that? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna grab another tool. I'm just gonna do what we call it stripping the input shaft. I'm just gonna pull the nut off here and then take the whole thing. I knew I was gonna drop that. Then take the whole thing over and we'll talk about it. All right. Okay. Uh, this is your throw out. Basically, it comes down through here. When you pull, out, pull in on the clutch, this little bearing pushes your pressure plate outward. That's controlled by your clutch, or I mean your clutch hand. These are the springs we we're talking about. I'm going to go ahead and take them out of the equation. So now, on this particular clutch, and some of them are different. I just mentioned some of them are in the back. I forgot that on the Kawasaki's, this entire setup, your slipper clutch and your assist clutch for your magnetic advantage are all handled here between the pressure plate and the inner hub. So basically what I want to show you is here's your, here's your plates, they're spinning, your bike's running, everything's good. You pull in on your clutch, your pressure plate slips out a little bit, loosens everything up. 
You click the bike into gear, and since your clutch isn't engaged, it doesn't roll. You let the clutch go, a little bit, this thing comes down, the springs compress it, and you're on your way. Smooth and simple, right? Well, that's where the assist comes in. So from this standpoint, when you're moving forward, these ramps, and I'm gonna show you in reverse here. Basically, the clutch goes in like this, it compresses, and then these big aggressive ramps, the more power you put to this, the more the ramps suck this in. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll take this apart here for you in a minute. Well then, we're gonna downshift. Well, if this was completely clamped, you downshift, the bike goes Well on these, they go, they ramp off. And basically what happens is under deceleration, you have a clutch, and this is very dramatic, but see how, see how when I spin it this way, now all these plates are loose. I let my clutch go, my plates loosen, so instead of my rear wheel barking or hopping, the clutch slips and it's a much smoother downshift. Very, very smooth. This is a very nice setup for most people this is, a, this is all you need. The reason we're changing this is so that we can go drag racing, but you gotta admit that the technology for all of this, <laughs> the one thing they don't have, and I guess I should mention this, when we do have the different spring setups, we can put on our top hats, we can put different shims, we can really adjust the amount of pressure, how hard the launch is. On something like this, you're really sort of limited, and I mean, you can shim these springs but it, and make them stiffer or, or, or not, and that'll help the feel, help your initial bite, but it's not gonna do anything when it comes to grabbing like top end, land speed or whatever, because these ramps are gonna apply far more mechanical advantage than these springs could ever think about. So just sort of keep that in mind, and I'm gonna go ahead and begin the conversion process. What does that mean? Oh look, I have a really expensive looking box of stuff that's going to take a long time. As I mentioned, not going to bore you with that. I'm going to go ahead and do this and we'll wrap it up here shortly. Hey guys, I wanted to stop real quick because we have a slightly different clutch arrangement that we're going to do here. I stripped the input shaft like we said before. Here's the ZH2 as it clutch as it came out of the bike. There's our, our springs here. I'm going to go ahead and pull the pressure plate off here. And then what I'm going to do I'm just going to pull this off and let you see. So this has the assist and the slipper clutch all work off of this, off of these ramps. You've got corresponding ramps in here. And like I said, depending on what you're doing, it's either going to go in, it's going to clamp it for high speeds, or it's going to move it back when the rear wheel overdrives the transmission on a downshift to let the clutch slip a little bit. So what we're going to do is, that as we mentioned, that's just no good for drag racing. So we're going to convert this over to a more traditional style clutch. And when I say traditional style, let me get these parts out of here. It's got a regular pressure plate that relies on nothing but springs to clamp the clutch, but this particular version does have a built-in slipper clutch. So if we put everything together the, the same way, we'd have our same problem where the bike just wouldn't want to leave smoothly because we'd be getting this number. So, clutch mod to the rescue. This simple little part, we're going to leave it here. We're not going to remove the uh, slipper clutch, but we are going to disable it by putting this little piece in here and then this little piece and what that does when you clamp the when you clamp the nut down tight now it can't ramp so now we've converted it over to a, a just a typical standard style style clutch so what are we going to do to control the spring pressure or the clamp force well we're going to do it old school with some really heavy duty springs and we're even going to add some adjustment shims to make that stiffer because this exact arrangement was the same clutch setup that we used on the Sport Rider Ninja H2 to go 226 miles an hour. So we know it'll hold as much clutch as we need for this bike, and it may get land speed racing. <laughs> we may do, see some naked land speed racing on the ZH2 here. But also from the drag strip standpoint, 
Uh, we went eight seconds stock wheelbase and a quarter mile with the same setup with Jeremy Teasley riding another um, H2. So we know it works well for the drag strip and for land speed racing. Now, as far as disadvantages, what are the disadvantages? From a clamp standpoint, nothing. This is as much spring pressure as we need. And in fact, I want to point something out here. Even though the ZH2 only has about 500 miles in break-in miles, look at this. Look at the discoloration in some of the clutch plates. Now, I've ridden the bike out on the street, but I didn't try to launch it. It's my first attempt at launching a ZH2. We're not going to do a burnout or anything. We're just going to see what we get here. I don't know if the owner tried to launch it or if this is normal for these bikes. We just don't have the experience with them. But I can tell you what, I'm going to inspect this clutch and you know how we do it. If anything needs to be replaced, we'll replace just the one, one part. But otherwise, we'll be putting this clutch back on, put this setup together. It's going to be super strong, super fast and it'll be all the clutch this bike will need even once we do get it de-restricted that starts making mid 200s in horsepower area. All right, our friend Dan is here to pick up his ZH2 that he left over a year ago. Uh, he's from Tennessee, we're in Ohio. Because this project has sort of went in the direction it has, naturally, it's raining. I would like to stop for a minute on the day that he came to pick up his bike. So we'll talk to him a little bit about that. We were gonna mic him up and have him go for a ride, but we'll decide what we're gonna do and you get to check it out. Mr. Mill Holland, dri drive all the way from Tennessee to watch it rain in Ohio. I believe it was snowing and raining up here by dropping it off. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, cool, Corey. We push it outside, but I know we're gonna get wet. So it's not like it's an all new motorcycle, but it is yeah. much different motorcycle. It looks so much flatter. It <laughs> I mean, just looking at it. It looks like we pulled a hundred pounds <laughs> off the rear end of that with the you know little tail tidy you said. Yeah, I went ahead and we pulled off the rear pegs and yeah. put little plugs in there. Just it cleaned it up so nice. Looks so much you can put it back on if Lydia wants to go to oh, yeah. be ride these with you. Yeah. Man, uh, but the pipe looks so much better we went to the big canister. Yeah. It saved a whole lot of weight too. I can't remember exactly how much, but it was a lot. And then we went ahead and lowered it a little bit for you. Oh, that's good. That's about, yeah. about as far as you can as go. As far as I can go. Yeah. Yep. Without, without some kind of either internal force mods, and you can't even space these up easily because it's sort of a one oh, piece right. top clamp. That's it. Tell us what you think. Oh, wow. <laughs> Boy, that looks good. I put your uh, year old expired tip tag on, but. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that feel good? Yes. So, so you guys know, because of delays, <laughs> Dan's carbon fiber BST wheels aren't here yet. We'll send you, we'll send those to you. But the way this bike rides and handles now, I cannot imagine it with those BSTs on there. Well, I just think about how much they help on my 14. Well, you're you're right in the heart of of good riding country. Twisties. Yeah. Well, that's what sold me. I mean, Zach Zach had them on his 14. And we went riding to the mountains together and we swapped bikes. And I said, I gotta have these. It makes so much difference. So I'm hoping, I love the way the Z900 handles and stuff. Yep. So I'm really hoping this will quicken the steering up, make it more flickable. Speaking of quicker steering, why don't you give us a little shake test here on, right. the, on the front end? Yeah, that looks great. You know, look right. nice. And we really worked hard to. A lot, of, a lot of them you buy, you don't get enough key access. Yes. You got yep. real nice key access. Yep. That's perfect. Isn't that nice? And I've got it set where I like it, but you go ahead and click, go ahead and uh, crank that damper down. I mean, clicks what half. That was minus seven. That's where I've been running. Really? Yeah, but check it now with you, with it all turned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and before, before before even all the way closed, it was about the same as minus ten to twelve clicks on this. They Batuba did a really nice job coming up with uh, coming up with our the damping on. Well, I'm proud to have that because I know even in stock form, you know, it get yeah, it get twitched. And, and the thing is, I was talking about on the video before too, the the bars, you know, you've just got so much leverage, leverage. with those yep. bars. Wide and, bars. That, and that's why that's why the standard damper just damper wasn't gonna work out. We you know, got all custom valving, that that's all Brock's. 
Man, that, that fitting hurt can do. Doesn't it? Yeah, Super it was, clean. It looks better than what it did in the pictures. We even put in it, it's even got a damper so it won't rattle. You know, the factory ones even, I've heard those rattle on, on a box before. Yeah. So, you have the official land speed clutch set up, you may want. You got a clutch there now, don't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's not. No, it's not, not tearing no, off. No, yeah. but it yeah. is a lot, a lot firmer pull. Oh yeah, I go from that three spring assist setup to that. Yeah, but that's really what you're gonna. That's what you gotta have to during race this thing. Yes. Well, right. you. <laughs> so guys, remember if, if you if you saw in the video, we saw some clutch wear and some heat, and I said, Dan, is there a chance <laughs> that this bike may have been launched from a dead stop before it came to me? <laughs> and uh, what are those things called? Draggies. 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 They've got him and his boys have these draggies. And in order to do zero to 100, you got to start at zero. So he's been launching it. What, what did you think of the launch in stock form? Um, not so good. No. 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 no not so yeah, good. Both the boys even tried it. And they're a lot better riders than I am. But they, you they can't, can't do it. it. No, you can't do it. You, it, it, you can't. It's, it's not. It's not how it works, so you can't ride it out. Once that thing starts to lock, it just snaps up. It just, yeah, exactly, snatches right up, yep. spin the tire if the bike's a little longer or whatever. But right. with that set up, it'll be smooth, and if you guys decide to go land speed racing, you'll have plenty of clutch there, well, too. You know, we talked about it, and I know it's a naked bike. You know, they got classes for naked bikes. Oh, I know. You know, so we're kind of curious. Oh, I, to believe me, I, I already had you penciled in for some <laughs> naked classes on this thing. So we'll have to see what it does wide open but I think it's gonna be a hooted drag it, it, it's gonna be fun and then uh, eventually hopefully we'll get the ECU flashed but what we wanted to do was let Dan pick up the bike and just we'll talk about the dyno runs here in a minute the power but I want you to I want you to feel that I'm not gonna mess with putting it on the dyno we'll let you feel it we'll see what the weather does we may have to make some adjustments there but why don't uh, would you like to see some of the, the dyno runs now? Absolutely. See where we are before or after? <laughs> that only took a year. <laughs> All right, let's go do that here. Well, like that kickstand. I look I'm telling you, we, we got it as good as we know how to make it. And you got the adjustable links on there. Oh, this looks good. And that looked nice. You like the green plate? Yes. I, I'd send you home with another one, too, if you want. Man, that looks good. Hmm. Bike just being snugged up changes the appearance of it too. It is. I like it. You, it's you so can, much cleaner. You can feel the weight reduction. Mr. Milholland. <laughs> March 15th, 2020. The um, the beginning of this project and COVID. Same week, I'm pretty sure. You came in, had great weather, March, real nice. Correction factor is a 0 0.97, and the bike made 184 horsepower, which is was really stout. I, I was surprised with the uh, surprised with the power it made, and then uh, 94 foot pounds of torque. You brought the bike. We had to develop some products. Once we finally got our products, so we could start doing our tuning, it was later later in the year. And in fact, I can tell you when, <laughs> July. Let me go ahead and pull up July, and you can see. <laughs> Base as delivered with nothing the same. The bike simply sat here. We went from 184 horsepower to 172. Guys, that's why we do base runs, right? Because otherwise, if we try to compare what we did to that 184, it's going to be off all the time. Yeah. So that's where we started with our product development. And, and you can see the correction factor is a 1.05 and much, much higher humidity. So that's why it just didn't make as much power. So that's where we started. Let me go ahead and get rid of the uh, Disneyland point zero point nine seven. We we were, I think we were living in uh, South Florida, a little below sea level there for a minute. And now, okay, so there's where we started our our testing. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up. We we the first thing we did, Sprint Filter got us a filter first. Right. So we put the filter, just the filter. That's all we did. And you can see, that's a real nice game. Absolutely. Real nice up top. Now. We'll get 10 horsepower on some of the other supercharged bikes. Well, this still has an ECU. If you look over here in the dyno chart, it is lowering the butterfly or the uh, throttle valves are closed down below 50% at the rev limiter. It just tanks. So you, you, we've got. <laughs> if you just imagine there, we're looking at a hundred horsepower gain once we can in that area once we can get to the, uh, you know, get it flashed. So just keeping up with that same 
deal. Let's go to what happens when you add our pentacarbon slip on with the sprint filter and we got our power commander in. So we were able to put our map, we developed mapping for the power commander on, and on pump gas. And you can see that's another really, really nice game. Yes. Let, me, let me get the blue one out of the way. Another another nice gain, still with the stock ECU. I mean, right now, that bike's acting like a normally aspirated bike, right? We're we're increasing the flow where we can, and then uh, and we're getting nice results from 179 peak to 190. Yeah. So that's pretty nice. Yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and get the uh, we'll get that one out of the way, and let's throw in. Oh, that's right. Then we got our full system. And I, I hate, <laughs> yeah, throw the full system in. Now, 200 horsepower. Whoop, we did it. But I got to tell you, on this particular one, we cheated. Because I wanted to see 200, I knew I could get it. So I had some MRX02 race gas, and I went ahead and created an MRX02 map to match the full system to bump that thing up above 200 horsepower. And your bike has a map switch on it. So now you've got the pump gas map. In position one, you got the MRX02 map in position two because I know you're going to put some gas in it and, and try and go faster. Now let me show you something interesting though, and this, this is really pretty. This is pretty cool. Let me get rid of that. We'll go back to the way the bike is set up right now on pump gas. We're at 197 horsepower on pump gas right now. That this is how the bike is set up right now. Now we're comparing that. I actually took the wrong one out. Close select. Let me put this back in. Okay. Sure, yeah. So there we go. Okay. We made 200 on MRX02. We made 197. We're making 197 on 93 octane. It did the same on Shell as it did Marathon. It's top tier gas. It doesn't matter. But the point is, is you know that MRX02 is typically worth quite a bit more than that, especially in the supercharged yes. engine for the uh, yes. for the cooling effect. So about more than three horsepower. Exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, winter time in Ohio, you're not going to get a fresh batch of MRX02. We can get some here now, hopefully now that it's springtime. But I would expect that 200 horsepower to go up 205. 205. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe maybe a little bit more. It's in there. Yeah. We got everything out of it we could with a stock ECU. <laughs> so 197 for the way it's sitting uh, right now makes 197, gas. and that's what I want you to take a ride. <laughs> we'll uh, just just let you go take a ride with that. And and you rode the bike before. It it yeah. it, it made uh, good power. Let's let's do a, a quickie comparison here. So this is this is where we were when we started our product development. The blue line is where we started our product development. The red line is where you are now and you can see there's a, a really nice horsepower gain and a big old torque gain like that thing needs any more torque right <laughs> with its wheel base and the way it's set up but yeah we went from a we picked up a solid 10 foot pounds of torque pretty yeah. much everywhere 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 yeah so so that's nice the big the big piece of the puzzle of course is the ecu flash so at some point we'll get to that but until then I took that bike for a ride. <laughs> this is going to sound silly, right? I can't ride a Grom without giggling. I can't do it. I got this. I got this little shitty smile on my face. I can't stop. I get that. Look, goosebumps. Yeah, goosebumps. I got that on that bike because it is so nimble and so confidence-inspiring. <laughs> and I'm watching myself. I'm floating wheelies, going. I don't know if I should be doing this. Just a damper. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. But I want to. I want to get your reaction. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna. We're gonna mic. Have you ever been mic'd up before? No. Nope. Nope. Yeah. The first time mic job. Uh, we're gonna mic up Dan and put him on the bike. So uh -huh. instead of the dyno, we, we we've all heard dyno runs, yeah. right? We'll just see what you think about 197 horsepower on a bike like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready. Let's do it. This should be fun. Okay, Dan, we got you mic'd up. Come here. Let me see something. All right, coming out here, what we see? Rain. That's right. <laughs> Rain in Ohio, because we just can't delay this project long enough, can we? <laughs> so, do you want to go ride your 200 horsepower motorcycle in the rain, or should we go ahead and postpone this for a, a, a little warmer time? Uh, a little, I'm little, smart enough to hold off. Yeah, 50 degrees in rain, and because uh, and, I'm turning all the, the nanny controls off, where you, you get to go experience that, that 200.
In the rain. In the rain, yeah. <laughs> so we'll wait for it to dry up. You okay. said you've got some errands to run near here. Maybe we can uh, get some better weather tomorrow. So we're going to postpone this for now. Go have some fun. Doing something. And come back at it. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dan. Hey, everybody. We're back. Well, Dan. <laughs> How did you enjoy your weekend in Ohio? <laughs> like I have every weekend in Ohio. Uh, yeah, rain, yeah, cold. Yeah, rain, cold. <laughs> so anyway, it's the next day. <laughs> it stopped raining where you went, mm -hmm. but it didn't stop raining here, and we were only about 90 minutes away. So it's raining, it's cold. Dan still needs, to, uh, we're, we're going to have a little fun here. <laughs> one of the things, uh, one of the things we got complaints about our our track or I mean our moto vlogging skills making people uh, making people all sick. So we have our nice new Hero Eight set up here. We had it all set up on Dan's helmet. Hold on, there you go. Right? How fast you been? Two oh eight. Two oh eight. Dan's been faster than I have. I've been two oh one and some change. So ah, we're gonna put Dan on the motorcycle with no rain and see what he thinks. First of all though, I think we, we uh, the first thing we have to do is get this thing fired up because you haven't even heard it. Nope. Right? Nope. So it sounded like a sewing machine when you brought it in. Yep. We'll go ahead and get it fired. And it's cold, so it's gonna fast idle, so don't let that bother you. But she, pentacarbons have a very unique sound to them. They sort of bark. It's, we, we worked very hard on the bark. So uh, we also sent you home with a, uh, a suppressor so if you decide to go on a long ride and you don't want to irritate the people around you or whoever else might be on the back seat you just shove it in it's one bolt goes in get where you're going pull it out the way anybody you want <laughs> the supercharged engines boy they are just it's it is a hell of a sound especially at uh at higher rpms well you remember it at wilmington oh, yeah. with h2 uh, was yeah zach. with zach on the h2 yeah. you you knew what bike was going yeah. down the track you didn't even have to look <laughs> and the pentacarbon is very similar but we changed the packing around a little bit it's got a different tier and it's real high temp packing so you don't have to worry about it burning okay. out or changing any of that stuff I think about the only thing we didn't go over when you were here last time was the map switch. So, and I'm not sure, if, for those of you who aren't familiar, DinoJet makes a real simple little switch that you just mount up here in your controls. You can see it's got, this position has one dimple, this position has two, and what that does, that allows you to, sh to change maps. You can change them on the fly, depending on what you're doing, like the nitrous guys will put a nitrous map in position yeah. two. Uh, and the normally aspirated map. What we did on this one is he's got our pump gas uh, street map in position number one for 93 octane, any top tier, shell, marathon, you know, any, any of those guys. And then the MRX02, which we run as opposed to MR12, because this is a higher compression engine uh, without having to have a laptop or anything like that. You can dump that in, switch over to two, good to go. So makes it simple and easy and uh, pretty hard to mess up. So all right, we're going to send you on your ride. <laughs> uh, he's only going to be able to ride it for as long as the, uh, well, your dash will start flashing because it'll get mad. Which, since we don't have a flash, you're still going to have the, the flashing dash, and then we'll have to, before you leave, I'll take my uh, OBD2 scanner, clear out the codes, and then you won't have any more problems with that. So without further ado, remember... Scan side to side. I'll stand in front. You <laughs> can see if we can make anybody sick. <laughs> there you go. 
think we're having a little too much fun here. Uh, we need to have fun. You know, we can do it but the rain. I guess I'll fasten it. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, you the quick shifter and the uh, the auto blipper are both turned on, so okay, you can put that. Front end starts diving and back pushing it into the dyno. <laughs> back end starts scooting around. <laughs> exactly. And I think, what am I doing 167 sitting still? <laughs> sitting still. <laughs> Smiling. Yeah. Um, but no, it, I, I'll tell you what, Dan. It, we, I think we got every horsepower out of this thing that, that we can get until we can get past that ECU restriction. And quite frankly, if we can ever get past it, I think it'll happen, but this one's being tough. I don't remember it taking, I don't remember so many different people working on something and it taking this long, flash-wise. But it's got the new Euro 5, you get California compliant, and the new Euro 5 spec has anti-tampering built into it. So they, they made it anti-tamper, I, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh -huh. But either way, it, does, it doesn't matter. And that's why I really wanted to get Dan's reaction riding the bike because when you take this thing out for a ride, you can't just let anybody jump on this motorcycle. I mean, if you turn all the power down, yeah. it'd be okay. Uh -huh. Most people are not really going to have any idea that it's even restricted. You can feel, I'll feel it, you feel it. But it, 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 it's, all, it's strange the way it happens because just as the aerodynamics and the wind really would start slowing you down, they just gradually slow you down. So a lot of people's minds would never, they would, they would never realize it. We'll find out tomorrow. Yeah. Tennessee's beautiful right now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you get across the Ohio border, it'll probably dry in sunshine. You pull it out of the trailer and go for a ride. And they run home. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed the, the ZH2. Virtual. You like it. Virtual yeah. ride. Virtual yeah. ride. Yeah. It was only a year in the making. Well, that's true. How'd that damper work? 
<laughs> I hope I never find out, but it sure is good insurance. Because I have been on packs without them before that need them, and I know this one needed it. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, oh, yeah. no doubt. With third gear, you know, at 8,000 RPM, it's off the ground, and it sits down if you're a little bit crooked. Uh, that'll be a nice, welcome addition right there. But boy, it does, it does rip quick. It does. It does. It is, it is, it is quick. The, motor, right. the way that motor revs, and, and it's strong too. It's got a lot of, it's got a lot of torque, a lot of low end torque. Yeah. And they put that extra compression to it to right. kick you in the ass, yep. it kicks you. Uh, one thing, guys, I don't know if any of you think you may have seen this gentleman before. He works at, uh, you work for Kawasaki doing different displays here and there. He's a big time Kawasaki fan and a part time employee. Part time on call temp for uh, consumer events. Okay. Do demos around the country and, you know, IMS shows and stuff like that. So if you're at an I IMS show or a demo, you've done Daytona, the rides down there, that kind of stuff. If you are a ZH2 owner, walk up to him and thank him because if it weren't for him, all this cool new fancy stuff that we've come up with, we don't even know where it'd be. I'm sure we could have found a bike by now. Yeah. But but it's it's all Dan's doing. This man loaned this bike for uh, I don't even want to say a year plus. A couple days, That's right? all right. So I knew it going in. It was you take you've while. got other bikes, and yeah, we we knew it was going to be tough with the new Euro Five standards. And we've said it before. It, it's just going to keep getting tougher. That's what that stuff's built yeah. into. So we'll get better tools in our toolbox. So. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we can get through this, and I just can't even, even imagine what riding this bike with 220, 230 <laughs> horsepower is going to feel like. We'll find out. Well, give me I'll a call. Know. Give me a call tomorrow and tell me what 200 feels. Like. All right, and uh, I just want to thank you. No problem. And I'm sure the guys out there's got all your products know what I mean. Oh, yeah. You're the best. Well, I appreciate it. We try hard, and you've you've got to go through the whole deal. We don't we don't half ass it. Oh you know, no, no there, there is no, there is none of that. It's either right or we don't sell it. Period. So, on that note, I'm Brock from Brock's Performance. Our buddy Dan Milholland here. Till next time, we'll see you then.